I knew nothing about mental health issues until I was being diagnosed with mental health issues. I was 30, I was procrastinating and self-sabotaging as a hobby. I was unable to understand or process my emotions. I was misusing substances just to cope with normal social situations, feeling like loving and healthy relationships were the most petrifying things on earth. And generally feeling like the creation of planet Earth was a super awful and boring idea. I knew I needed to speak to someone when for the first time I understood why people took their own lives. I weren't actually suicidal myself, but I got it and I never had before. Despite going through so much from such a young age, I'd always remained really strong and hopeful, but all of a sudden, out of nowhere, I found myself often feeling numb, blank, and unenthusiastic about everything. And being someone who's usually super encouraging and sensitive to the world around me, this scared me, big time. And when I was told that I had ADHD, I was torn between feeling completely confused and doomed to actually feeling quite free. I didn't know it then, but the diagnosis was actually the beginning of my journey to inner healing and self-discovery because I didn't realise how alone I felt until I found out that I wasn't. I was actually beginning to get myself and there were people out there that did too. And this was a great comfort for me because I'd lived a life of people pleasing to cover up shame. And now I was actually giving myself the permission to embrace my true self and peel away all those layers of self-hatred and guilt in the process. I felt empowered to know that my struggles and my symptoms didn't have to define me. And so I did everything I could to find out about how ADHD had impacted my life, the lives of other people that have it, and just how I could live a peaceful and productive life. ADHD stands for Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder. As the name states, those who are diagnosed with it are said to be hyperactive in nature and lack the ability to pay attention. An awful name and a description for the disorder if you ask me, but that's a whole different conversation. Like many people, whenever I'd heard about ADHD, I associated it with disruptive and attention-seeking schoolboys. I hadn't ever really heard about it anywhere apart from when people were talking about bad behaviour at school. And I thought that the hyperactive outbursts that these boys had were because they weren't getting enough attention at home. So the parents were to blame. But in truth, it, hadn't just, it just hadn't been brought up in a normal conversation. So I had no idea that it was an actual neurological disorder. On my journey to understanding ADHD and myself, I was actually told by more than one medical professional that ADHD is in fact something that only schoolboys have and that they grow out of it by puberty. This helped me understand why so many women live with this, the disorder undiagnosed. ADHD is complex and it manifests itself differently in everybody, including girls and boys separately. Because an ADHD brain is always understimulated, those with the condition often find that they can't focus on one thing at a time and act on impulse. Whilst boys seek stimulation outwardly, appearing to be hyperactive and disruptive, girls usually search for the extra stimuli inwardly. Then, because negative thoughts and feelings are some of the most stimulating experiences, girls are more likely to suffer with things like overthinking and overanalyzing and low self-esteem and anxiety. This then leads to a more reserved hyperactivity which presents itself through things like nail biting, fidgeting, chewing pen lids to death, twisting our hair into knots, doodling, talking too much, drifting off to daydream at inappropriate times, talking over people and cutting ourselves off mid-sentence to change the subject. These weren't the only symptoms and traits associated with ADHD that I struggled with though. And as I got older, some symptoms that started to present themselves over the years and still do are chronic procrastination, troubled or toxic relationships, problems starting simple tasks, rejection sensitive dysphoria, which is a painful fear of rejection, restlessness and irritability, 
Emotional dysregulation, which is the inability to regulate or manage emotions. Indecisiveness and an inability to prioritize. So not knowing what should be done first because of an interest-based nervous system deciding for me. Forgetfulness. Delusions of being a skilled multitasker, which can then cause a person to get into the toxic habit of starting several tasks without finishing them. Social anxiety, double booking and poor time management. Impulsiveness, including spending and poor decision making. Eating disorders, chronic overwhelm, depression, which is understandable if you've spent years grappling the above. And believe it or not, the list does go on. Now, I was told that only medication could help me. But because of all the stigmas around mental health medication, I was petrified of taking it. So I did everything I could to find out how you can manage ADHD medication free. I found so many different coping mechanisms, strategies. Um, and what I also found out is that a lot of professionals were talking about a change in diet as a way of balancing some of the chemicals that people with ADHD lack. This encouraged me to start experimenting on myself by cutting out the things that were said to trigger my symptoms. And within a few short months, as well as a lot of other daily practices and habits, the effect was life-changing, literally. I was feeling productive, semi-stable, able to handle my emotions and my workload, and altogether just feeling really empowered and confident. I started blogging and speaking at schools and events and just doing anything I could to help end the stigma around ADHD and mental health in general and just try and ensure that people had and heard positive conversations where they could access important information around topics that I'd never heard mentioned in the past. I knew that if I did this, even if it was only a few, people would gain information that would give them clarity and clarity leads to peace. My blog and my upcoming book are actually called A Road to Peace. And I spoke to hundreds of people, mainly women of all ages, who after reading it, couldn't believe that somebody was describing their day-to-day -day struggles so accurately. Like me, they've never been, they were never able to understand why they thought, acted and felt certain ways. And so hearing that somebody understood and hearing that there were ways to manage it, it was life changing for some of them. This encouraged me to continue sharing, even when I felt like I was getting bored of my own voice and convincing myself that everyone was feeling exactly the same. A year into this newfound passion of mine, a colleague came up to me at work. He'd heard about my recent diagnosis and the work that I was doing around mental health advocacy, and he felt like he related to some of it and just wanted to voice it to someone before speaking to a professional or labeling himself. We were at work at the time um, and we were on the sales floor and with it being near billing day and a manager walking past, we both just ran to our seats. Um, and we mined to each other that we would, we would catch up later, um, but we didn't catch up because he committed suicide that night. And this threw me into a place so dark, I, I thought that I would never be able to get out. Within a day of hearing what had happened to him, I just felt like a different person. I no longer wanted to manage my ADHD or talk about mental health. I felt like a thick grey cloud was just wrapped around me and I couldn't feel or think anything. I was on autopilot at work doing everything I could to try to establish a wellness program because I was so scared that other people were going through similar but had no one to talk to and no support. And when that got refused, I was acting like a zombie at home and completely avoiding human contact. When I reluctantly let a friend come round to see me, I explained to her that whilst I felt nothing, I also hadn't felt so scared or low in my life. And hearing myself say that led to me seeking help once again. And that's when I got diagnosed with CPTSD. That's complex post-traumatic stress disorder, which is an anxiety disorder associated with ongoing or repeat trauma. I'd never heard of it before, but I had vaguely heard of PTSD, which I thought was just 
um, a condition that war veterans had, which referred to the fact that they have very realistic nightmares that prevent them from sleeping. And I've probably heard that in a film or a soap or something. Trauma changes how we view the world. Someone can develop PTSD after hearing about, witnessing, or personally experiencing just one traumatic event. And the nature can vary depending on the person. Those who have seek PTSD have often experienced different traumatic events one after another without any support or lived in devastating circumstances such as childhood neglect, domestic or sexual abuse, human trafficking, persistent bullying, ongoing racial discrimination, and living in poverty or a war zone, just to name a few. Not all traumatic events lead to an anxiety disorder, but as I mentioned before, if a person doesn't receive the right levels of support, comfort and reassurance, then the effects might not show up straight away, but they can be devastating and lifelong. I had been exposed to and surrounded by traumatic events and dysfunction from a very young age. By the time I was 21, I had been separated from my birth father, taken to a new city with my mum and my brother, where my mum got into a toxic relationship, which really reflected in the home environment. There, I witnessed a lot of domestic violence, substance misuse, um, I lost my mum to a heroin overdose when I was 15 and was in denial for years. I was put into foster care. I was severely abused and stabbed by my first example of a serious boyfriend. Suffered with eating disorders, self-esteem issues, rejection and abandonment issues, substance misuse of my own to numb it out and the list actually again does go on. I had successfully put all of this trauma into a jar and literally just buried it somewhere deep down inside so that I could focus on being the person that I wanted to be. Someone who was accepted and respected rather than pitied and looked down on. And I felt like I was doing a great job and I was often described as strong and resilient, which confirmed it. When I heard about what happened to my colleague though, and with an awareness that I could have helped him, it was like the intensity of the pain and the guilt pushed the lid off of that jar and everything that I had suppressed just started to leak out. It wasn't just an overload of unfamiliar emotions, but I was flooded with memories that I didn't know existed, flashbacks that would last for months at a time sometimes, bitterness, guilt, anger, paranoia, grief, and this weird sense that I was watching myself rather than actually living as myself. When this led to the CPTSD diagnosis, it made a lot of sense to me because whilst I'd got on with my life after everything that had happened, I'd never actually dealt with or processed any of it. I would just tried to avoid all the heaviness attached and numbed myself out with work, church, friends, and any other distraction. I was so intrigued as I began learning about CPTSD because I found that a lot of the symptoms that I resonated with were similar to, if not identical, to the ones that I struggled with under the ADHD diagnosis. The ones that I resonated with the most were mood swings, which is similar to emotional dysregulation, hyperarousal, which can show up as irritability, anxiety, anger and bitterness, depression, dissociation, intrusive thoughts which can lead to overthinking, emotional flashbacks which can cause impulsivity and emotional dis dysregulation, again symptoms of ADHD, feelings of shame and guilt which are what people with low self-esteem often experience, and self-harm which showed up as substance misuse and eating disorders for me. I knew that addressing some of the pains from my past was going to be a painful process that I didn't feel ready for. But I also knew that if I did, I could finally come to terms with a lot of the things that had happened, get some order in my life, but also minimise some of the symptoms that I struggled with in, with my ADHD do diagnosis. Because with having CPTSD, they were basically doubled. I won't go into all of the nitty gritty, but also beautiful details, but what a journey. 
project Clean Up Penny's Life had begun and it all started with patience, prayers and a lot of tears. Tears that I had held in for literally years. I was aware that I should experience an influx of emotion, but I really wasn't ready for how triggered I found myself to be by almost everything. My nervous system was a mess and I was struggling to get out of fight or flight mode. I wanted to give up so many times and just go back to some of my unhealthy habits of numbing it all out, but I knew that it was finally time to face some of these wounds and see myself free. So I did everything I could. I researched, I studied, I, I tried, I fought, and I loved on myself in a way that I never had before. I also spent a lot of time reconnecting with my inner child to reparent her and give her what she so desperately needed, love, safety and security. What did this look like? I spoke life over myself with positive, uplifting affirmations and Bible verses that challenged my limiting beliefs and feelings of low self-worth. I re-engaged with hobbies that I've neglected like art and reading. I read loads about my symptoms so I could understand myself more. I wrote my feelings down in a journal every day, just like I had when I was a child. I listened to uplifting music and danced around like a ballerina. I stopped misusing substances. I asked for help and saw a therapist. I took time off work. I let go of pressure and people pleasing. I explored my creative side. I immersed myself in nature. I watched loads of cozy films and comedy with nostalgia attached. I laughed and cried a lot. I listened to YouTube videos and podcasts with stories of hope and healing. I separated myself from toxic people. I forgave those who had hurt me, including myself. I made a conscious effort to be more present and I tried to make sure that I ate things that would be nourishing to my mind as well as my body. Over time, I stopped feeling like I was riding a wayward Amola coaster. That's an emotional roller coaster. And I learned how to process emotions as they came up. I stopped putting ridiculous pressure on myself to be perfect and a shining example when I am, in fact, just human and dealing with and working through a lot of mess. A process that doesn't need an end date to be used to provide light to others. And this is something that I had to learn because I felt that I couldn't actually heal alone. I continuously wanted to help others with everything I was learning. So I started writing again and actually mentoring women who wore similar shoes to me. Women who had the same symptoms and struggles but were given different labels and so were being, being treated for totally different things. From ADHD to bipolar disorder, general anxiety disorder, Asperger's, depression, schizophrenia and borderline personality disorder. The main thing that we had in common, aside from our mental struggles and the way that our days looked and felt, were that we all had some pain that had been swept under the rug and had never quite been forgotten. I've been learning about how ADHD and unresolved trauma shows up in people's lives for just under five years now, and I've been living with the effects since as far back as I can remember. And what I've discovered is that because trauma takes quite a long time to start showing up in our lives, the effects of it, this is why women get diagnosed with ADHD and other neurological differences or mental health issues so late. The inward symptoms we struggle with as a child are kind of mild and ignored and are processed in such a way that we just accept derogatory labels given to us, such as lazy, dippy, forgetful, clumsy, oversensitive, antisocial, difficult, needy, airheaded, and scatty. As an adult, these traits and characteristics start to affect our lives and the lives of our loved ones in more serious ways. And then if there's any hidden trauma buried on top of that, as the lid starts to fall off and the traits or symptoms are doubled, so to speak, that's when alarm bells start ringing and diagnoses are made. Before that happens though, unfortunately, substance misuse seems to be one of the most common coping mechanisms for undiagnosed patients. And substance misuse actually severely impairs our brain's function. So it's causing even more damage later down the line. 
I also learned that trauma usually remains unresolved for so long because when an issue does arise and a person goes to see a doctor, the symptoms and traits that they talk about are usually bunched together to form illnesses or labels. And these help doctors prescribe medication as a first resort, rather than trying to discover whether this is in fact a traumatized person that just needs to dig deep and do some real soul work. Over the years, I've realized that we need to treat symptoms and not labels. I've also realized that by loving on ourselves through committing to change, understanding our symptoms and our conditions, processing and embracing our emotions, adopting positive habits and eliminating toxic ones, and by being really, really compassionate and patient with ourselves, we can be free from a lot of the things that we felt had us bound permanently. Our progress does not need to be blocked forever. I was told that only medication would help me. And whilst I think medication is great for those who need it and use it, I also knew that my habits and my environment and also my past played a massive part in what I was struggling with. So instead of trying to get my head around this massive, daunting, incurable brain disorder, which is what ADHD is known to be, I just decided to try to focus on the healable struggles I was having, the pain in my life that needed addressing, the effects that that pain had had. I dug deeper into every symptom because I knew that whilst trauma is playing a massive part, I also had ADHD. So I'm getting a double whammy of the hard stuff. The trauma wasn't just magnifying my ADHD symptoms, but it was actually causing my body discomfort too, because unresolved trauma begins to manifest as pain and physical sickness. And there are so many of us just living with ailments and illnesses that we don't understand and that never get better, like it's acceptable and it's not. But that, again, is a whole separate conversation. I sometimes wonder how many people have been diagnosed with lifelong mental health conditions when in fact they've just had their heart broken and their souls shaken real bad. If more medical professionals were trauma informed and knew what unresolved trauma looked like and what the symptoms were, would this be addressed before strong medications for incurable disorders were dished out? unresolved trauma could be causing our brains more damage than we realize and we're feeling it now more than ever because with so much traumatic things happening in the world at the moment we're finding it really difficult to keep our past pains buried and it's all coming up we're losing the ability to suppress it because our soul needs deep healing the greatest thing about the healing journey is you only have to start small to see big changes. And quite often, the biggest change comes from making the decision to start in the first place. So I want to end by encouraging anyone who is struggling to accept, manage or understand the diagnosis. You are not defined by any labels. Trauma is real and it's healable. And with a little bit of commitment, self-compassion, patience and resilience, that healing can happen and it leads to freedom and true inner peace.